Welcome to the Momxiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momxiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this momxiety together. Welcome to episode 15 of the Momxiety Club podcast. Today, I'm talking with Sydney Maisel Straitman about her experiences with infertility, the importance of therapy and having a community, parenting after fertility struggles, and social media and parenthood. Before we get started, I just want to thank you for listening. It would mean the world to me if you would reach out and connect with me on social media or via email. I love interacting and hearing from you, so send me a message just to say hi or to share a milestone that your little one has achieved or something that you're struggling with right now in motherhood. You can reach me at momxiety, M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y, club, on Instagram and Facebook, or you can send me an email at hello at momxietyclub.com. And I want to give a shout out on that note to a few listeners who wrote in this past week. I want to say thank you to Courtney, who reached out on social media and responded to a post. Courtney shared how she had similar feelings to what last week's guest, Lynn April, had uh, experienced. And Courtney also said, thanks for what you're doing. I'm listening. Well, thank you, Courtney, for listening, and thank you for reaching out and engaging on social media. I also want to say thank you to Emma Johnson, who wrote an email, and this is a little bit of it. She said, hi, thank you so much for your podcast. I'm currently struggling through postpartum anxiety a second time around. And listening to the podcast with Lynn April really resonated with me as her postpartum anxiety experience is very similar to mine. Well, it was so nice hearing from you, Emma, and chatting with you over email. And I am looking forward to hearing more from you soon and supporting you throughout this journey. Okay. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, know that if I reference anything in the episode, like articles, previous episodes, guest social media, or ways to work with me or become a member of the Momxiety Club membership, you can find a link to these in the show notes. So if you're driving, rocking baby to sleep, making dinner, or any of the other amazing multitasking mom superpowers that you're doing, you don't have to worry about taking a note or a mental note to remember to look it up later. Also a reminder to make sure you hit the subscribe button in wherever you listen to your podcasts. That way your busy mom brain doesn't have to remember one more thing and the next episode will automatically show up on your phone or wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, let's get into the interview for today. Sydney is 33 and lives in Philadelphia with her two-year-old son, Jonah, her dog, Saya, and husband, Andrew. Together for 16 years now, Sydney and Andrew spent seven years in Manhattan building their respective careers and decided to move to Philadelphia when they started thinking about having children of their own so they could be closer to their families. The road to parenthood wasn't easy, though, and Sydney underwent eight consecutive rounds of fertility treatment, culminating in a successful in vitro fertilization. Sydney started blogging to raise awareness about fertility, the often difficult and winding roads to conception, and to cultivate a community of women and men who were experiencing or had experienced similar struggles. All right, without further ado, here is my interview with Sydney Maisel Straitman. Hey, Sid. Thank you for joining me here for the Momxiety Club podcast. I'm very excited for you to share your story. Thank you for having me. So how are you doing? 
I'm good. I actually feel like you're asking me on a day where my mom's anxiety, <laughs> my mom's anxiety is higher than normal. Um, but uh, you know, otherwise we're hanging in. It's crazy times, but um, I think um, we're all doing everything we can to just like keep our heads above water for the foreseeable future. That's right. That's right. Anything that we can do or that I can do to support you with relieving your mom's anxiety. <sighs> Oof. Um, you know what? I actually just find that talking to other moms, to other working women is the greatest therapy that I've ever had and that I've been able to really cultivate for myself. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to this conversation because I think it's always really helpful to talk to other women in a similar, um, similar age as I am in a similar or stage of parenthood. So I think that this will be informational and cathartic and therapeutic. Right. Well, wonderful. That's the goal is to also help you as you are sharing and helping others. So cool. um, can you just start out sharing a little about yourself and your experience with anxiety? Like bef- were you an anxious person growing up? Were Because I find that a lot of times it's either continues throughout the the lifespan or it's like right. smacks you right in the face after having a kid. <laughs> yeah, no, I have always sort of walked around with like a low state of anxiety and it has um escalated at different points. So when I was younger, my parents often tell me the story where I would be in a grocery store with like another uh, another, uh, a family friend. Um, I would be like five or six. We were living in Pittsburgh at the time. Um, and another a friend's mom would pick me up from school and we go to the grocery store and then the mom would leave for a second to pick out apples. And I would start to panic. I just was afraid I was going to be left alone in, you know, the, aisle, the, the, the produce aisle that doesn't come from anything that happened to me as a child. I just always had, um, it's not like there was a triggering point, but I was always very anxious and nervous as a kid. I I actually was diagnosed with separation anxiety disorder when I was eight or nine or so, um, really had difficulty at school drop-offs, just really upset that my parents, you know, weren't going to come back again. Um, not triggered by anything, just always kind of had that. Um, and again, like at different points, it was escalated and more, um, intense than other points. Um, but then, you know, I find that I was able to kind of have an outlet in school sports, um, in achieving academically, that was really, you know, important for me. And that was an outlet for my anxiety sometimes. Um, and then I was really involved in my, um, youth group, um, where I ended up meeting my husband today called the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization. And it's a, um, Jewish leadership, um, youth group. And I was really able to like hone in on those skills. Um, so in high school, again, like low grade anxiety, but, uh, this is a long answer, sorry, but low grade anxiety, but I had outlets. Um, and then, when I got to college, um, again, the anxiety, you know, came up again and I had a lot of performance anxiety with academics again. And I was in a huge school where I wasn't the top performer anymore. And the anxiety came up again. Um, so again, th- there's this path where it's just kind of like peaks and valleys. Um, and to kind of, you know, go back to your original question about mom's mom's like mom anxiety. Um, I, again, I was, I was in a good place. And then, um, my husband, and I just started trying to conceive, um, about three years into, or two or three years into us being married. We had been together for about 14 years at that point. Um, and then that road to conception was really, really difficult. Um, I had a lot of anxiety about what, I thought people might be perceiving about our path that we weren't getting pregnant right away, what that meant about my health. I was doing everything to be healthy. We went through eight months of fertility treatment and nothing worked until we ended up doing in vitro fertilization, which worked not even on the first time, but on the second time. And that fertility path for someone who was already anxious because of control issues was a the greatest test to your anxiety and your mental health that you could really encounter leading up to parenthood. Um, And then as a parent, I actually think that I have surprisingly been 
a less anxious parent because of those experiences. Um, and I've also, as I was going through that fertility treatment, sought out a fantastic therapist who I still speak to weekly. Um, we talk on the phone. We've actually met in person just once. And she was a great fit for me. And she's really helped me with the anxieties that I've had for being a mother and a working mother um, and all of that stuff. So again, that's a, a very long answer, but the 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 summary is I've always had anxiety. It's just arisen in a more pronounced way at different points of my life. What I picked up on uh, along with everything else, but what really stuck out to me was that you, that great test of what you were going through with infertility and treatment and that that really prepared you to be less anxious throughout. And you got those supports set in place during that. So you were not scrambling or trying to figure everything out once you had Jonah. I think that is the perfect way to put it. I was able to identify very early on that I was not in a good mental state to go through this, the the ups and downs of trying to conceive and the emotional burden that hormonal therapy puts on you. Um, and I would say midway through the process, I was trying to be very strong initially. Um, I went back on a low dosage of anxiety medicine that I hadn't been on for years. I, I just knew I was not able to handle all of that myself, primarily because the pressures I was putting on myself. Um, and then I, right before we got pregnant with our son, Jonah, um, I was going into IVF. Um, and that was when I found this incredible therapist who I has taught me so much about myself and has taught me so much about my anxiety and what anxiety is that it, I realized it would have been foolish of me to not continue speaking with her as I entered the journey of parenthood. So when you were working with that therapist and you had said you had outlets and ways to kind of cope throughout the peaks and valleys of your, your entire life, did they help you identify new coping mechanisms? That's what we always taught kids when I was in mental health and everything. Did they help you identify new things that you were not aware of, or was it more just kind of reinforcing and supporting you to do what you needed to do? It's a great question. I would say both. And I can give two examples of each. One in terms of emotional coping and the other in terms of, I would say, physical coping and outlets. Um, as many people who might be listening to this know, anxiety is an overestimation of a threat in the future and an, an underestimation of your ability to handle that threat. I, I, I hope I got that right. Yes, that was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, when, and your mind wanders, right? It's often a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. You you think one thing and then it snowballs into another and into another, et cetera, et cetera. When I was going through fertility treatment, my mind was wandering in every which way. And I started to go down the path of how, it, you know, will I have to find a surrogate? How will I afford a surrogate? Um, you know, what about if I don't want surrogacy? How do I feel about adoption? I think it's wonderful, but I never thought about it for myself and, and your mind wanders, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I would go to extremes like, well, if I have to pay for a surrogate, that's like $50,000, $100,000. How am I going to afford childcare, <laughs> right? All right. these things that are just uh, ca catastrophizing. But anyway, the one thing that I, that I um, started to do during fertility treatment which was a recommendation, I think, for my therapist. But in order to make my mind not wonder, I needed to do something that I had a goal in mind with my hands. So what I actually started to do is I started to color this massive poster that now is in my son's room. And it was like basically a coloring book, but like a four foot by four foot poster. And I started to color this poster from the time that I was going through IVF, literally through the week before he was born. And it oh. took a 10 months to do. And every time my mind started to wander, I picked up my coloring pencils and I started to color this poster because it was an outlet. And I was so focused on coloring that I wasn't letting my mind wander. So that is to your first, the, to answer your first question, that was a physical outlet for myself. Mm -hmm. One of the things that my therapist has taught me now is that none of my thoughts are based in reality. So I need to continue 
every time I have a thought to ground myself about what is actually realistic and what is not a catastrophic thought in my head. So for example, when my son um, was, now he's almost two and a half, but he has been in daycare since the time he was 14 weeks old. And there were a lot of kids in his class that had, and I'm blanking on the name right now, um, the pulmonary uh, R, RS, oh, RS, RSV, yes. I think. Yeah, RSV. RSV. Right. Which is basically the a child starts gasping for air and it can be, it can be very, very dangerous. He had a classmate who had RSV and immediately in my mind, I went to, Jonah's going to get RSV. This, this child is going to give Jonah RSV. The fact of the matter was this child had some health issues. The child was born very premature. The child ended up being fine. But I started to get very concerned that just because child A had RSV, that my six-month-old was also going to have RSV and we were going to be in the emergency room for six nights and th- so on and so forth. That was not based in reality. That was a thought that I had that I convinced myself was going to be true, but in no way was that a thought that was based in reality whatsoever. And that is just a small example of what I've had to do to cope emotionally and mentally with the often very scary things about being a parent is that you might have a thought and you might have a threat come into your mind, but that threat is not actually a realistic thing that's going to happen. Right, right. And I I definitely have been in that same situation, not, not the exact same, but have had those thoughts like, oh, we went to a play group or yes, a classmate had a cold and there we go. Next time, yep. next thing we, next thing we know is I'm picturing us somewhere, you know, in the hospital for days. So. Right. And now all of us have COVID, right? In this climate, you know, every time you see a kid with a runny nose, it go you, it catapults or it snowballs into, well, we're going to see my parents and my parents are over the age of 65. And are they ever going to see their grandkid again? And, you know, this is a unprecedented times to be a parent. Um, but yeah, I think that the, just the one thing I keep going back to is that I've, I'll convince myself left, right, and sideways that I have a thought and that thought's true, but it's very rare that that thought has ever come true. Right. Right. I, I agree with you with all the, the thoughts that yeah. I can have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, I want to touch back on, you mentioned a little bit of something about the emotional burden that the hormone treatment put on you. Yep. Was that something that you were made aware of or was that Um, were you looking for that affecting you differently or was it kind of just like, Hmm, this started happening? I think it was a combination of a lot of things. Um, there was, when I was going through fertility treatment, I was on a number of different medical protocols. Um, and some medications didn't affect me at all. And other medications affected me intensely. Um, I think I was probably informed by the doctor that I might have some side effects, but the situation that I was in at the time, which I will just briefly summarize of my husband, and I left New York city to move to Philadelphia so we could start a family. I expected everything to happen right away. Things didn't happen right away. I was not in a good job at the time. I had seen my first therapist who wasn't the right fit for me things just weren't lining up as I had envisioned them to line up. And I think that life not going the way that I had planned as a control freak in some ways, combined with being on hormonal treatment was a recipe for disaster. So um, that being said, I think it was a combination of a lot of things. I know that this particular medication that I was on, it was progesterone, which is often needed to I guess the best way to put it is like maintain a pregnancy once Mm -hmm. you are pregnant. Um, Some people react also poorly to progesterone. It depends on the type of progesterone. I reacted really poorly to progesterone. Meanwhile, when I started and I was on that type of progesterone, when I was going through my IUIs, um, intrauterine inseminations, which is for lack of a better term, sorry to be crass, basically a turkey baster. (laughs) And that's how they're trying to get you pregnant. Um, But with IVF, interestingly enough, which is probably more intense hormones, Mm -hmm. shots every day, I reacted fine. Um, I actually think that there was something that you're in control with IVF. You're doing something every single day to 
um, get the result that you want. You're going into the doctors every other day to be monitored and you're able to see the shot that I put in my belly two nights ago has resulted in now a mature egg follicle, right? Whereas infertility, so much is up in the air and you basically just, you know, going for a, a quick procedure and you wait two weeks and you hope something happens, right? Mm -hmm. IVF is much more regimented and you are much more in control because I myself was giving myself my shots. So I think that that had something to do with like not reacting as poorly as I did to the me other medication that I was on previously, if that makes sense. That That is, that makes perfect sense. And the, I feel like we are very similar in our control. And yes, I remember even just when we were, uh, you know, thinking about and trying to get pregnant, it was just that control aspect is like, okay, well now I have to wait and see and right. what's going on. And that is very, it's very easy to convince yourself that you are pregnant or that you are not pregnant and both at the same time and just spiral as you're saying that snowball, I call it my like negative spiral. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that so many people think of, and we can, you know, I'm sure we'll touch on social media in a little yes. bit, but so many people think that this is like getting pregnant is a foregone conclusion. And what is often not discussed, which I think adds to the way that women like us who like to be in control and who are overachievers. And every time we set ourselves to do something, we're able to achieve it. The process of getting pregnant is completely out of your control. Mm -hmm. And you are not only are you seeing on social media, people getting pregnant and posting photos and all this stuff. And it seems like a foregone conclusion, which is absolutely not. And everyone has a background and a story, but on top of that, you are in a vulnerable emotional state where you want something so badly that you will convince yourself that that thing is happening. Mm -hmm. And then you'll also try to protect yourself by convincing yourself it's not happening. So yes. it is a completely um, unique set of mental exercises that women that are trying to get pregnant have to go through on a monthly basis. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that is uh, along with being hormonal because you're going through all these body changes and all that stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's quite the journey. <laughs> it's quite it, the adventure. Yes. Um, well, you're, we are just headed right into social media. So yeah. you're saying how, I guess, my big push is that social media isn't real. Most of the time I try to be honest and open and it is challenging. So how did that affect you with seeing things? Did that, did you want to see people's pregnancy announcements? Did that completely set you into that snowball downward? Um, just if you could share about that. I found social media to be, I wrote a blog post on this. I, I said, uh, social media is the devil. Like there's the water boy yes. quote, uh, foosball is the devil mama. Like social media is the devil. Um, I was so impacted by it that I unfollowed anyone who had announced a pregnancy. And this is, I was primarily on Instagram. I wasn't even active, but I just like would scroll the way we all do, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd unfollow anyone who had announced a pregnancy. I was um, un, un, illegitimate, what's the word I'm looking for? Unjustifiably angry at those people for posting their announcements. Mm -hmm. People that had new children, I unfollowed. And I basically just like lived in a bubble of, um, following people who I knew weren't going to announce pregnancies or have children anytime yeah. soon. Um, I knew in my, I knew that it is often not easy. Um, but I couldn't understand why people weren't honest, right? I couldn't understand if people did have trouble, why they weren't honest about it in a way that I ended up being very, very transparent. And the fact that I started writing a weekly blog mm -hmm. during our fertility treatment, to me, I thought if I can be honest about it and I can help other women at the same time and create a community for myself, why aren't other people doing that? And what I've learned is that a lot of people, um, first of all, I think people post on social media because it's what everyone else does. And you, you know, you, 
you want to post pictures and, and I feel this now. I think my son, as we all do, is the most beautiful human in the world. And I want to post pictures of him and our incredible family. I also still am very sensitive to what other people might see. Right. And I mm-hmm. refrain from posting often. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. I, I think that the bottom line is that it is often hard to convince yourself that other people have had issues when all you see is the highlight reel and right. all you see are these incredible, beautiful photos of, you know, the, the newborn is home and the family is having their professional photos taken and the mom's hair is blown out and everyone looks beautiful and the baby's curled up in this little like fur nest or whatever it is. And I'm like, <laughs> that kid hasn't slept in three days. That mom, sorry to be crass, but that mom has, her milk is coming in right now. She can't walk because she just had a vaginal birth. Like, I mean, none of that is reality. What That is a right. highlight reel. So um, I now know that, but I think that we are so ingrained to think that social media is a representation of what everyone's daily life looks like that um, we convince ourselves that what we see isn't what is actually going on, right? Is, is what we see is the reality and not just the beautiful photo one in 60 that a parent took of their toddler. Right. Right. Um, So yeah, I I don't know if that answered your question. I just, social media gets me angry. So I... It did. Yes. Um, so, and you, you created that space for having the honest, uh, blogs and your honest writing. Now, was that also, were you always a writer before that that was hmm. cathartic to you? Um, and then you just wanted to share in order to help others. I was not, a, I mean, say for being an English major in college, I was not a writer. Um, I've always found that I express myself best with the writing, um, but I, I found that, you know, there is a million and a half mom blogs out there, but I was not able to find within my community a blog about fertility. I also have, if it's not clear already, a fairly dry and sarcastic sense of humor. And I think that a lot of people were, a lot of the blogs that I came across were two things. They were either faith-based um, and there was a lot of um, women who were used uh, their platforms to talk about the power of God in their fertility journeys. Mm-hmm. And I didn't identify with that. I think that that's wonderful, but that didn't, I could not um, empathize with that. Um, and then there's other women who basically had blogs about like medical journals and right. like, here's the process. And this is what this medication is. But again, I didn't, that didn't feel like it was going to be helpful to my end goal, which was to create awareness, um, to, you know, let people know that what you might see on the surface, which in my case was a, um, a girl in her, at the time, late twenties who married her high school sweetheart, who built this, you know, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm saying this, what this perception might've been, right. Who built this incredible career in New York city and had this, you know, master's degree from Columbia university. Like all of that seems like perfection on the outside, but what was really going on was unexplained infertility. No matter what we did, no matter what I ate, no matter how I exercised, you know, no matter what I did, I wasn't getting pregnant. And I wanted to use my writing as, and sort of my like unique sense of humor and perhaps sarcasm and bluntness, which I wasn't seeing Mm -hmm. to, to build, to really feel relatable to other women. And that was ultimately my goal. Um, as I've been told that goal, I was successful in doing that because I've had countless women reach out saying, I, you said exactly what I was feeling like, and, Mm -hmm. and that was ultimately what I intended to do. Well, thank you for starting that and helping others, uh, because it's goes along with mental health and the stigma on that and talking a little bit about the stigma of infertility, but these things, why don't we talk about them? Why don't we share our feelings? Why don't we share what's really going on? Right. I think that it's just really important to know, and I'm, I have a number of friends who, um, are similar to me where every goal that they've ever set for themselves 
they've been able to achieve, whether it's like getting in shape for a wedding or achieving the bar or or passing the bar or, you know, whatever it might be, or getting a job and everything they've been able to set their mind to, they've been able to do. And um, when a lot of people can't quickly achieve the ultimate goal of getting pregnant and starting a family, they see it as a failure. And um, there is nothing else. I can't underscore enough that it is not a failure. It is literally a chance game. Um, And my fertility doctor at one point had said to me after our first failed IVF transfer, she said, if you flip the coin enough, it'll, it'll land on heads. And what I literally did was that night after I got the news that we weren't pregnant, the first IVF transfer, and this is after we had had six failed medicated cycles, I literally sat there and I flipped a coin. And there was something that felt really tangible about that, really statistically um, encouraging that if you flip the coin enough, it will happen. Now, that's not to say that like, you know, someone who has very, very intense medical issues and and I don't even want to be a doctor right now, like I, I, I would never say that to them because I don't know what everyone's history is. Mm-hmm. But I think that and I'm not a medical doctor. As I said, I was an English major. <laughs> but I, I, I think that the point is there, when you have anxiety and you can't control the situation, just because you're not getting pregnant easily, it doesn't mean that um, A, you're alone because so many people are experiencing it. And it also doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that you should be even the slightest bit ashamed because it is the same thing as saying like, you know, your inability to get pregnant right easily is like saying like, oh, I just wish that I was able to grow my eyebrows out a little bit more. You know, like sometimes you just can't control things. And that's a bad analogy. No, but it's very true. It's that's, I think every single person, even if they were able to get pregnant immediately, they still have those, those weeks leading up to it going, well, what if I can't, I'm going to fail as a woman, like this, that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. And it's just this innate, I think, thought that we all have, right. that we have to, as you're saying, keep grounding yourself and remind ourselves that it's just, I, lo- I love how you said, literally a chance game. Yeah, literally a chance game. And then the last thing I'll say is that one of the things that 